into St. Peter's Church on this first Sunday in Advent. It did throw me a little bit, but apparently Christmas is on Sunday this year, so we're in Advent now. And um, so before we pray, we've just put up a little compare and contrast. So we've got a picture of the old as it was before with all the pews. So now you can just appreciate all the warmth and the chairs we've got now. So let's pray. So Lord, thank you so much for this space. Thank you for the opportunity for us all to come together and to be together and to rest in your presence. Lord, thank you so much that we have this opportunity to worship you and to praise your name together. Amen. So now please stand if you're able for our first song, House of the Lord. Oh, 
So we now, please take a seat. I would have just left you standing then, sorry. So we now come, because we are in the first Sunday of Advent, we have brought out our Advent wreath again. And before that we light the candle, I'd just like us to take a moment to just be aware that this is a time where we get to enter this, this story. So at, where coming up to that time of waiting, that time when people were, were waiting for Jesus, our God with us, to come into the world. So we're joining into a time where, where we remember that waiting, but we can also be thankful that God did come to us. Jesus did come to us, and through all the amazing things he did, he has just set us free and invited us into a new life with him. So as we light the Advent wreath and as we sing our next song as a response, it's just a time to be grateful and to join in that memory of a time when people were just waiting and hungry for that God with us. So, would anybody like to come and light the first candle? Oh, we've got, we've got a volunteer. Come up. <laughs> What's your name? Catherine. Ian. Would you like, you, can ha you have a choice, would you like to use the taper or would you like to use the lighter? And could you just light one of any of the purple candles? So let's pray. So loving Jesus, we give you thanks that you came to join us in the world as a little baby who grew and traveled along with us. So help us to sit in this time of waiting and help us to appreciate that journey, appreciate that time where we can come together and to celebrate your birth. But until then, just be with us and help us to rest in your loving presence. Amen. So now as a response, we're going to um, stand and sing our next song. So please stand if you're able.
Please be seated and we'll pray. So let's pray together. So Lord, as we enter this time of Advent, um, please just let our prayer be a simple one. With all the all the busyness and all the distractions that come with this time of year, all the adverts and the running around, just help us to become aware that there is a, a deeper reality, a deeper truth. We just ask that you make that, that deeper truth, that knowledge and that love of you, 
just apparent to everyone, Lord. Just ask that you help people to sense your presence, to sense that invitation into a better and a different way of living, one that inspires us to to really follow the words and the teachings that you gave us, words that inspire us to act justly and with mercy and with love towards all those around us. So Lord, this Advent, just just help us to see more of that reality and just break through and just reach out and touch all those people in the world who are still living without that knowledge of you and all the wonderful and inspiring change that that can bring. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we ask that you just just shower Warsaw with your love at this time. Just be with all those in our community who need you and who, who are just crying out for you. We just ask that you be with them come alongside them and just really help them to feel your presence at this time. Lord, we remember all those who have been bereaved and who are facing this first Christmas without their loved ones. We remember the friends and the family of Thomas Stanley Hill, Kelly Stanton, and Kathleen Oakley. We ask that you be with them, Lord. We ask that you comfort them and Look after them through this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also remember and lift up before you Samantha, who contacted our church and asked for prayer. Lord, we don't know, we don't know why she's asking for prayer, but we know that you do. And we know that you love her and care for her and are watching over her even now. So we just lift her up before you, Lord, and ask that you just cradle her in your hands and carry her through this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we know that you, you love us and care for us and that we are each your beloved son or daughter. And we just remember all those times where we have got swept up in the, the busyness and been distracted or lost our patience or done anything that we know is something that we shouldn't as, as your followers, as your people as your beloved children. So Lord, we say sorry, knowing that you love us and forgive us and call us into this amazing way of life that you've set out for us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're now going to go straight into our first Bible reading, which I think is Colin. Yes.
reading is from Matthew 11, and it's verses 25 to 30, and it's headed, Come to me, and I will give you rest. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. When I was asked to talk today, I chose the passage that we've just heard in the Bible because over the last few weeks and probably months, it's been speaking to me personally. In fact, it's been shouting at me, um, but I haven't particularly been listening. So today I'm going to tell you about those verses and, and how they are impacting my life at this moment. Um, so. I'm going to start from when I was working. When I was in my paid working life, I was a teacher and then a childminder, and then I worked in a family business. My husband and I worked like Trojans for as many hours in the day as we could fit in, and our aim was to provide a good life for our family, and we, we wanted to earn enough money so that we could retire. So I fitted in church on a Sunday after a very busy working week, and it's probably there that I heard these words, come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And they're beautiful words, and I often found that they worked for me. I regularly went to church feeling physically tired and emotionally drained, but I found that being part of a worship service, especially singing the wonderful, uplifting songs, gave me the strength and the energy to get back into the madness of my working week and move forward with another working week, same old work, work, work. So I retired five years ago, and I focused a lot of my energy into working for the church. And that meant, to start with, that I transferred this working philosophy to St. Peter's and carried on in the same way. But over time, I've learned that to contribute to church life, I need to work and rest in the way that Jesus invites us to do. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. So he's inviting us to come to him to get to know him just as he knows us, and that is intimately. So I found that as I got to know Jesus better, my mindset began to change. I felt the need to be with Christian people more and more, and to really take an active part in worship. Over time, sermons began to mean something to me personally, and sometimes questioning questions that were bothering me in life were answered by somebody preaching on verses from the Bible. And because I've got to know Jesus' heart more intimately, he has shown me that money alone won't bring me happiness. And I've learned that although I can afford to buy certain possessions, at the end of the day, I've collected just stuff. Jesus has turned many of my values on their head and has made me think very differently about my life. And when Jesus refers to all who are heavy laden, he's asking all of us to bring our money worries, our fears for the future, our fears about how we look, our fears about how other pe we think other people think about us, our fears for our self, se uh, safety or wealth or health and our reputation. 
all those useless burdens that carry us, that weigh us down, he tells us to bring them to his feet and then to leave them there. And then when we've done that, he asks us to take his yoke upon us and learn from him. Now, a yoke, as you probably know, is something that you put round an animal's neck to help it drag along a plough or something similar. Jesus carries the weight of the world on his shoulders, but he doesn't want to simply pass it on to us, expecting us to carry it on our own. Instead, he wants to share it with us, and he asks us to take on burdens that are worth bearing. So in place of worrying about money, he gives us a heart to want to help the poor. Instead of worrying about ourselves, our careers, our security and our future, he gives us a heart for the sick, the imprisoned, the lonely and the destitute. Before I found my faith in Jesus, I wasn't overly concerned with anybody apart from my, beyond my family and myself, I suppose. But once Jesus got a hold of me, I realized that I had a true heart for all sorts of people, especially the people here in the community of St. Peter's. And because I now understand God's love for me, I've been able to share it with other people here. Now, Jesus or God's love looks like something. So to a person who's lonely, it may mean a visit. To a single mom, it may mean an adult conversation over a cup of coffee. To a person suffering, suffering in addiction, it may mean acceptance and a willingness to understand why they have made those life choices. And for a person struggling to get from A to B, it may mean giving them a lift. In St. Peter's, it simply means getting involved. And here, we, as we all know, we have a wonderful and supportive church and I've always loved being a part of this community. Even though I became very busy serving in these sort of ways, I rarely felt exhausted because, as the Bible says, Jesus' heart was with this church and I was sharing that yoke with him. One of the things I got involved with here was, of course, the building project, and I've talked about it before as really stretching me, and um, it, I, I just did more things that I ever knew I was pos it was possible to do. And God has been so good to us, and after 10 years, as we know, we finally achieved what we aimed for. We have a warm, welcoming building in which we can worship and praise our Lord. But now the building is 90% finished, people will often come up to me and congratulate me on my part in what this project has, has happened. And they'll say something like, I bet you're so pleased with how it's all turned out. Well, yes, I am absolutely delighted and very grateful that it's done. And I'm honestly in awe of how God has carried out his plans here. But inside of me, deep down inside of me, there are many times when I feel absolutely nothing. It's almost like my soul feels numb. Today's verse from Matthew 11 tells us that if we're tired from carrying heavy burdens, we can go to Jesus and he will give us rest. And yet, in the last few weeks, I have felt so busy and bogged down with tying up the loose ends on this project that my question to God was, how can I rest, Lord, when you have given me so much to do? But I've, what I've realized is that instead of sharing Jesus' yoke, I've reached over to him, I've taken it from him, and now I'm trying to shoulder it on my own. My work philosophy from years back has reared its ugly head again and it's no good to me. And in addition to all the finishing off, off jobs we've got to do, I was asked if I would prepare today's talk. Now, I was going to be away until the Wednesday just gone, so I set myself a task to complete this talk before I went. But unfortunately, that week we had a few funerals to attend, and I had several meetings at night. 
So every spare moment, I went to my desk and I sat down to, um, and tried to write ideas down of what to speak today. I must have spent about between 10 and 15 hours writing something. But when I read it back, the night, late on the night, just before I was due to go away, I was at, uh, absolutely angry, upset, you name it, I was it, because I realized that this just wasn't right. And when, I hit, when my head hit the pillow, pillow that night and I was suddenly wide awake, I'm sure we've all had those times, I was wondering what, what on earth had gone wrong and I was trying to take the words and rephrase them to make them sound better. And then when I wasn't thinking about this talk, a lot of all my worldly worries came back and haunted me and you know they were speaking loud to me. Sleep was almost impossible that night. And the next day, just hours before I was due to go on holiday, with my talk far from finished, I felt completely overwhelmed. I met with a group of friends and said, I'm sorry, but I can't do this. And I'm just going to pause here because I'm going to give you a break from listening to my voice. And Steve is going to read Psalm 40, which is another one that I've chosen. My help and my deliverer. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined my, to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the merry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O oh my Lord, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering, you have not delighted but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. Your heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek your rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God.
amazing that um, can you hear me still? Yeah, amazing that um, that that psalm just also shouted out to me. This psalm was written by David. He was a shepherd boy who became a king, and he was somebody who had a very close relationship with God. God loved him dearly. We know that David was a man who sometimes wandered off the wrong, the right path. Occasionally, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he got himself into arguments and scrapes. Now again, he just did the wrong things because he felt like them. But whatever the reason, David often found himself in difficult circumstances, and his life was far from easy. And as I say, this, this psalm spoke to me. It sounded a bit like my life, especially at this moment last week. Now, in my paid work, working life, I have experienced burnout in the past, and that led to serious depression. And at the moment of being overwhelmed, I felt as if I too was going to slide down those muddy walls on the way to the bottom of that awful pit again. Now, life can bring all sorts of stresses that can threaten to bring any of us down. Kids, friends, partners, husbands, wives, church, finances, debt, relationship with God, aging parents, the future, house maintenance, health, a job or lack of a job, education, relationships with people you work with, in-laws, performance at work, stepchildren, ex-spouse, unanswered prayer. The list is actually endless and any of those or a combination can make lead us to feel as though, though we too are going down into a deep, dark, muddy hole which we can't see a way out of on our own. It doesn't really matter what takes us down there. A black hole is a dark hole and it's a horrible place to be. The good news in Psalm 40 is in the first three verses, which describe David as having been rescued from this miry bog. Now, when I suffered from depression years ago, I know that my faith in God was pivotal in getting me well. But I've learned that God often allows difficulties to come my way to show me my own weaknesses and also to demonstrate his supernatural strength. I believe that this was one of those moments. Although I felt very vulnerable at the time, I knew that God would bring me through again, but it would be in his own timing. What I chose to do while I was waiting would be crucial to my turnaround, and it was important that I chose to be active and not passive. God didn't want me to run away. He didn't want me to hide at home. He didn't want me to stay in bed and do nothing while waiting to feel better. But he did send me on a few days holiday. This time, I made an effort to take him with me. Just as in verse 12 of this psalm, I recognized what I'd been doing wrong. I realized that I've been compartmentalizing God knowing that he's here with me in church, but forgetting that we, he was all around me, in me, below me, above me, and everywhere I went. And what I felt I was doing was I was picking him up when I came into this building, but then I'd leave him behind when I was talking to the builders or the contractors or the electricians, or when I had to go and do my busy day. This psalm reminded me that I can cry out to God and ask him to deliver me, waiting expectantly for him to answer. I repented, I just thought differently, by asking God to show me how I could make things right. I talked with a group of friends and we prayed together. Knowing that I had taken active steps to involve God in my anxiety, gave me almost instant peace. I wasn't judged. I wasn't made to feel that I was letting anyone down. But I would, was reminded that God was ready for my challenge. Verse 11 in this psalm tells us that God is compassionate 
and he loves us. It was suggested that I read Bible passages and verses in the Bible that made me feel more positive. So instead of scrolling aimlessly through my phone during the long journey on the motorway, I looked at and I wrote down scripture, which reminded me, and the one I chose was, love is patient and kind and not jealous or rude or boastful or proud, because that's one of my favorite. And I reminded myself that God loves me just like that. But he does correct and punish everyone he loves if they're going off track. I read that unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And I realized that my Christian life had reverted into becoming one of self-dependent toil and that God wasn't in everything I was doing. I needed to make sure I wasn't going it alone if I wanted to do something that has lasting value. I remembered that if I seek God with all my heart, I will find him because he's standing waiting for me to open the door and let him in. And all these verses from the Bible filled my heart with truths and drowned out those voices of anxiety and negativity that had begun to shout so loudly at me. Two of the verses in this psalm mention the word trust. I was asked that if I took a few days off from writing this talk to concentrate on going and drawing closer to God, would I trust that he would give me the words to say today. I decided to wait and to trust. But then on the, on the way home a few days later when I was thinking, I'm still not prepared, I was drawn to read the words of Psalm 23, which reminded me that I had rested in green pastures and my strength had been restored. I chose to believe that God was definitely on my case and that I would be able to speak today. In verse 6 to 8 of Psalm 40, it tells us that when we're in a pit, we must focus on obeying the Lord while we're waiting. It was very tempting for me to to carry on trying to prepare these words, especially as time was fast running out. But I'd already spent hours of wasted time going round and round in circles just So just doing it again for the sake of it was not going to make things happen. David mentions that God gave him a new song. I love these words because music is so instrumental in my faith. I've learned to praise when I'm sad, when I'm angry, and somehow the situation is diffused. To me, music is a weapon that I can use when things are going wrong. And like David, I often find that YouTube comes up with song words that I've never listened to before, but which speaks directly into my situation. It's almost like they're reaching down into my soul and they remind me of God's presence. Psalm 40 reminded me and tells us that in his own time, God will take us from our miry pit to a place of safety. And David calls this place the rock. I love this image because if someone asks me how I visualize Jesus, it's a steel rod on this rock. And I know after my depression, I was put there and I have remained there ever since. Usually, I picture myself standing bolt upright against this steel rod and I know that I'm safe. At the moment, because I'm having a little bit of a wobble, I'm more in a sitting down position with my back against the rod and my feet dangling over the edge of this dark abyss. Life is like that, and for all of us, it will sometimes want to send us back to our dark pits again. This last week has been a reminder to me that time spent with Jesus is never wasted. And the fact that I'm able to share something that's obviously close to my heart with you today is because I have come to him as the Bible told me. 
However, my other worldly anxieties are still looming in the background. They haven't disappeared. And that's why I'm going to choose these words from Matthew again and again. Come to me, all that you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I've got to take action to stop myself falling into that black hole of tiredness, being worn out or burned out, so I choose to come to him and receive rest for my soul by giving him my worries, my tensions, my stresses, my guilt, my fears, and my anxieties. Jesus will teach me to wait. He'll teach me to pause, to consider before I act, and to learn not to overcommit because his ways are gentle and humble. I'll learn, learn once again to let God set the pace in my life. And then when I shoulder that yoke with him, I'll remember that he is in the driving seat and not me. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kate. I know that's actually, that, that's an experience that I can identify with, so, yes. So, before we go into communion, uh, we're going to have one more song, and I think we can sing it as a response to Kate's words, so please stand if you're able, and we'll sing our next song together.
if we're going to let Jesus teach us, if we're going to learn from him, we need to know him and meet with him. Just as Kate explained, we have to choose to worship him, choose to engage, choose to expect God to show up and bless us and help us and know us. So what we're going to do now is say some words of praise. Remind ourselves how great and good and wonderful God is. Remind ourselves how much he loves each one of us. And then, if you don't love Jesus, if you want to know and love him more, come to the rail, come to the altar, and expect to meet him there. Expect him to bless you and love you and encourage you and affirm you and build you up. And then come back to your place and pray and praise and take hold of his presence with you. Listen for his voice. And when you leave here today, take him with you. Acknowledge that he is always with you, because he is. The words will be on screen. Please join in in the words in bold. And make this a time of prayer, praise, and celebration. Let's pray together. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. He is the one foretold by all the prophets whom Mary bore with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist was his herald and made him known when at last he came. In his love, Christ fills us with joy as we prepare to celebrate his birth so that when he comes again he may find us watching in prayer our hearts filled with wonder and praise and so with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we proclaim your glory and join in their unending hymn of praise holy 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 lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example, learn from him to obey his command. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may now be to us, his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. To you be glory and praise forever. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we bring alive the memory of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To you be glory and praise forever. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty. Blessing and honor and glory and power 
be yours forever and ever. Amen. Please have a seat. And as our Saviour taught us, so together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. So, draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your heart, by faith and with thanksgiving.
please be seated. And let's just pray together. Loving Jesus, we thank you that you do go before us. You do stand behind us and all around us. That all we have to do is run to you and you are always there. So just help us to really take that in and just accept it as a reality that we can reach out to you whenever we need us and you whenever we need you and you will be there for us. Amen. Now we have some little people back in the room, not just me, other little people. And I think they've been doing many, many things. I can see many colorful things. Would anybody like to come up and to share with us what you've been doing? They're coming up. Oh, have they gone shy? There's a first. Do you want to hold up what you've been doing? Am I giving the mic to Linda or Liv? Linda. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh. We're going to give it to Zoe. We've been colouring calendars. Which every door must be opened every day in December. I think she's a bit stuck. We've been doing advent calendars today and they've been calling them very nice. So everybody give them a round of applause for their efforts today. Okay. Thank you. So you've got advent calendars and they're looking amazing. That, should we give them another clap? Thank you. They might be staying up here for the last song, I think. So we're going to have one more song. So please stand. You can stop and dance if you like. Now they've had enough now. So let's stand for our final song.
So please do stay for tea and coffee. And um, I'm going to try and steal Gav's line. Um, please stay and talk to somebody you know and somebody you don't. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.